Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Bee Conservancy's webinar, Building a Pollinator Habitat. We are so glad to have you. We're just going to go over a few hive keeping rules as uh, others trickle in. And um, just so you know, attendees are muted by default, but we would love to know who you are and where you're from. So drop that in the chat. And uh, we will have a Q&A feature today. That's a separate box and no question is too big or small. So drop those questions in the box and keep an eye on them because we find a lot of people have the same questions and you can even upvote questions. Um, so that's our notes on the webinar today. I'm just going to let a few more people enter and uh, we will get started very shortly here. Uh, one thing I would love to announce is a quick highlight, one of my favorite topics, live events. Uh, the Bee Conservancy is really happy to have a virtual audience like yours today. However, if you are in New York, uh, we where we're headquartered, we are all over the city during October, so we would love to see you uh, come out. First up, we have the Urban Farm Tour this Saturday at Governor's Island, which is our flagship apiary. Um, we're also going to be in Staten Island twice this month, uh, October 10th on Monday at the Staten Island Zoo. And then again, October 15th, we'll be at another community garden hosting a workshop there talking about pollinators and cavity nesting bees. And then later on October 23rd, we're gonna be in Brooklyn at Prospect Park Zoo if you plan to visit. And for those of you who are not in the New York area, we still invite you to join our ongoing community science virtual event on iNaturalist. It's interactive and it can be done anywhere. And that is all for our programming. Uh, you can find all of our unbelievable programming at the TVC events page link here in the chat. And uh, next up, I would like to say thank you and express gratitude to Breakthrough Beverage, which, which has helped make this webinar possible. Uh, thank you, Breakthrough Beverage. And now I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca Louie, the Bee Conservancy's Executive Director and host and moderator today to get this webinar started. Take it away, Rebecca. Thanks so much, Mary, and thank you everybody for joining us tonight for this very important topic. Now, as we all know, pollinator populations are in decline, and there are a bunch of factors that are contributing to this, be it chemical pesticides, climate change, insects, pest disease, but the major one that we're here to talk about tonight is habitat. Now, habitat loss is a real issue, and our amazing panel of VIBs tonight will take us through practical ways that you can help create pollinator habitat. Whether you're a small space gardener, we want to transform a significant swath of land or are a business or organization looking to make an impact. Now remember, we'll have Q&A after all of today's presentations. So make sure to drop your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Now, first up is TBC's own Jennifer Palmer. She's our habitat program lead, a cartographer, a certified horticultural therapist, and founder of Brooklyn Nature Club. Take it away, Jenny. Thanks, Rebecca. I'm so pleased to be here to discuss pollinator habitat. So let's get started by talking about what defines a pollinator habitat. Pollinator habitat is a place where pollinators can access what they need to survive, including food, water, shelter, and nesting sites. It's a place where bees can find food in the form of pollen and nectar, where bees can access water at streams, ponds, and puddle edges, and even from patches of wet ground. It's where bees can find shelter from predators and extreme weather conditions. 
And it's a place where bees can make nests to raise their young, like in bare soil, native plants, and trees. Let's meet the bees. Most ground nesting bees are solitary bees that live alone. However, they often nest close to one another. Most ground nesting bees do not produce honey and do not have a queen and do not live in hives. They usually build their nests by digging holes in dry protected soil with their front legs and mouths. At the top of the slide, you can see the female cellophane bee making her nest. She creates a waterproof and mold resistant coating that she spreads onto the walls of her nest with her tongue. However, there are social ground nesting bees like bumblebees, which you can see at the bottom of the slide. Bumblebee queens usually establish small colonies hidden in hidden cavities below ground at the base of dense grasses and even inside abandoned rodent burrows. The majority of cavity nesting bees make nests in the hollow stems of plants, beetle tunnels, soft wood, crevices and rocks, and even in old snail shells. Cavity nesting bees create brood chambers separated by walls that can be made up of chewed up leaf pieces and petals, soft downy plant material, and even mud like the mason bee you can see at the top of the slide. And a bee's name gives a good indication of its nesting habits. For example, at the bottom of the screen, you can see the carpenter bee nest in the soft wood of the tree. Since plants are literally rooted to the ground, they have evolved to mate from a distance. They need wind or animals to help them. And since wind pollination is not very efficient, <clears throat> some flowering plants have evolved to rely on insects and other animal pollinators to carry their pollen to the stigma of another plant. Animal pollinators like bees transfer pollen between flowers when collecting their food. Bees are the only pollinators that intentionally gather pollen for their young. Other pollinators are just after the nectar and incidentally pollinate flowers in the process. Then fertilization can occur, which results in the production of seeds and sometimes fruit. Seeds can then germinate to become a new plant and that's pollination. Plants produce sweet nectar and protein rich pollen to lure the pollinators into the flowers. Generalists such as honeybees feed on many different kinds of plants, many different species of plants. Specialists feed on just one species or a select group of plants. This photo on the left of the bat drinking nectar illustrates how perfectly this pollinator is for this plant. The bat reaches deep into the flower to drink the nectar with its tongue while getting the pollen stuck to its furry forehead <clears throat> and will then transfer that pollen to the next flower of the same species. And bees do the same thing, but it's really easy to see that here with this bat photo. And the bee on the right is collecting pollen to take back to its nest. And you can see the pollen baskets on its hind legs and the pollen sticky and easy for the bee to collect for its babies. Bees pollinate many of our favorite foods, including apples, bananas, berries, melon, peaches, potatoes, vanilla, almonds, coffee, and chocolate. Countless ecosystems depend on the hard work of bees, but pollinators are suffering because native plant populations are diminishing. Habitat loss is a big problem for pollinators. Many of the causes that contribute to pollinator decline are listed on this slide. Something we can do to make a difference is to plant native plants that will restore habitat to help pollinators survive. A native, local, or endemic plant is one that naturally evolved in a habitat and is well adapted to the climate, soil, light, and water conditions in that particular area. The native pollinators of your area have a long evolutionary history tied closely with the native plants of your region. For example, here in New York City, native plants like the fall blooming goldenrods and asters shown here in this slide are able to endure long cold winters and hot humid summers and are resistant to local pests. The bloom structure on the cultivated rose, which is the photo on the right, 
with the tight petals makes it difficult for bees to access the nectar and pollen. And the photo on the left you can see is the native rose and that is easy and open for the um, bee to access the pollen and nectar it needs. And so when selecting plants, keep in mind the following terms, cultivar, nativar, and hybrid that have been bred by humans for certain characteristics and can have bloom shapes that may confuse the insects, may be inedible or nutritionally deficient, have different bloom times that don't match the pollinator habits. So please make sure to take a close look at plant labels when selecting plants. Introduced species need lots of maintenance, including excessive amounts of water. Plants that are introduced to an area can become invasive because they are unchecked without any natural predators or competition. They can quickly displace native plant species as well as wildlife that rely on the native species for food and shelter. So let's discuss a few ways that we can help bees on a local level. Choose plants that bloom in the spring, summer, and fall. Include winter if you live in a warmer climate. It's especially important to plant flowers that bloom in early spring and late summer so bees have enough food when emerging from and preparing for winter hibernation. Plant in groupings of each plant species for greater impact. If you don't have access to land, a yard, or other bare earth, you can plant pollinator plants in containers. Even a few plants in a container can benefit bees and other pollinators. Amazingly, just five flower heads provide enough pollen for a baby bee to live on. A clean, reliable source of water will provide drinking and bathing opportunities for bees. Bees work up quite a thirst foraging and collecting nectar. Fountains, ponds, or even a shallow bowl of water are excellent ways to keep bees healthy. Place rocks in the water for bees to land on so they don't drown. And just remember to change any stagnant water daily to deter mosquitoes. <clears throat> Create shelter and nesting areas for pollinators to raise their young. Planting a garden filled with native plants will provide bees with shelter from predators and severe weather. Bees can take shelter during weather events under plants and petal leaves. Bees can make nests in plant stems and don't forget to leave some bare soil for ground nesting bees. Plant native plants with woody stems for cavity nesting bees so they can make their nests in the dried stems and twigs and cut the hollow stem plants like Echinacea, the plant on the right, to about a foot above the ground in early spring after any overwintering cavity nesting bees have moved on. And the leaf cutter bees on the left carefully cut sections out of soft leaves to partition their nests. <clears throat> Harsh chemicals that kill weeds and insects also harm us and pollute our water. Beneficial insects and birds will be attracted to chemical free habitats and in turn will help keep unwanted pests under control. For example, planting daisies, dandelions, and dill will attract this assassin bug to your garden that will in turn eat the potato beetle that's eating your potato crop. But just be careful to check and see which plants are native to your area. Plant local grasses, sedges, and rushes to inhibit future weed growth and to provide cover nesting materials and nesting sites for bees. When weeding, make sure to pull out as much of the root system as possible. And if you're not ready to get rid of your lawn, don't mow it in the spring. And there's a movement called No Mow May, which will allow grass and other plants to grow for the month of May for pollinators, like early emerging queen bees. Limiting the mowing of your lawn to just once a month in the summer is also a great way to protect ground nesting bees. And mulch covers up the ground and makes it difficult or impossible for ground nesting bees to gain access to soil. So when the leaves fall from the trees and other plants in the fall, just leave them on the ground. The leaves will provide weed suppression and water retention, but they're lightweight enough to allow ground nesting bees to pass through. And they'll also help insulate the ground nesting bees during the winter. Leaving seed pods intact after they bloom in the summer will ensure migrating birds have a chance to fuel up before their long winter flights. 
Planting native plants for pollinators is the easiest and fastest way that we can help bees and all pollinators thrive in our urban regions. And make sure to observe what happens in your space. Every site is unique. And feel free to reach out to me with any questions or comments you have about pollinator habitat. And you can check out our website for more information. So thank you and thanks for helping pollinators. Thanks so much, Jenny. That was a great dive into the basics of pollination. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Wesley Swee, who has transformed more than 60 acres of land into pollinator meadow. Wes is the director of Merrimack Spring Park in St. James, Missouri. And after working in the Missouri Department of Conservation in the trout hatchery system for 16 years, he discovered a passion for planting for pollinators. Now he's about to tell us about the incredible work he's done. As a reminder, there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions for Wes or Jenny or any of our panelists, make sure to drop them there. Take it away, Wes. Thank you, Rebecca. Let me get my screen shared and we'll get started. Okay, well, welcome to Merrimack Spring Park. It is owned and operated by the Janus Foundation. We are a private non-for-profit organization that uh, is about an hour and a half southwest of St. Louis, and it's home to the fifth largest spring in the state of Missouri, pumping out about 100 million gallons a day. But before we get into the pollinator initiative we've been working on, let me tell you about how Merrimack Spring Park got started. So the the land was discovered by Thomas James in 1826, and he was an entrepreneur from Chillicothe, Ohio, and uh, he recognized the iron ore, the resources in the area, the spring, the timber, and he thought this would be a great location for the first ironworks west of the Mississippi. For the next 50 years, the ironworks distributed iron uh, across the region and even the country. And in 1912, William James passed away and he gifted his estate to his great granddaughter, Lucy Wortham James, who was born in St. James, but she, she moved to live in New York where she grew up. And upon her death in 1938, she is transferred her estate to the New York Community Trust who created the James Foundation in 1941 with her, her dying wishes to protect Merrimack Spring Park. And this is a quote from her will, as this is considered to be the most beautiful spot in Missouri, it is my great hope that you will arrange it. May it ever be in private considerable control and ever open to the enjoyment of the people, Lucy. So in 1941, Merrimack Spring Park opened to the public as a private park. It was quickly discovered uh, later that the cool 58 degree spring water would be ideal for a trout fishery. And so we partnered with the Missouri Department of Conservation and to create a trout fishery. And for the last 60 plus years, they've been stocking over 100,000 rainbow trout every single year. And as you can see, it is very popular. Usually people line the banks and catch thousands of fish here at the park. When I joined the James Foundation in 2019, we switched gears a little bit and added a new dimension to Merrimack Spring Park, the Pollinator Initiative. We had the land, staff, and resources available, and one key, key component of our Pollinator Initiative was the location of the park. It is on the northern route of the monarch butterfly migration. It's uh, right underneath that green arrow, about mid-Missouri, and that is the location of the park. We expanded our, our efforts from just monarchs to pollinators quickly after when we realized to help monarchs and, and pollinators, all you have to do is add milkweed seed to your, your wildfire mixes. So that was an easy choice to help both. Uh, here's an aerial map of Merrimack Spring Park. Uh, the boundary is the blue line. It's an 1800 acre nature preserve. And the shaded areas in pink are bottomland hay fields. So the park is right along the Merrimack River and these shaded areas were historically used for hay fields and they're primarily cool season grasses. And it was these areas 
that we mapped out about 150 acres of potential pollinator habitat. But to undertake such a, a large task like this, you will need extra help. And to do that, we had to remove the cool season fescue. And to do that, we contracted with a local farmer who came in and killed out the cool season fescue and then did a, used a no-till drill to plant the soybeans. And as the soybeans mature, they will add nitrogen to the soil and also they reach this, this stage of their growth called the canopy stage and they also shade out the weeds and grasses underneath. Uh, except for that large patch of Johnson grass in the background of the picture, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So when uh, the beans are ready for harvest, the combine will come through, and what this does is leaves a nice, clean seed bed ready for you to spread the uh, wildflower seeds that you're going to buy. Uh, the idea is to reduce all the competition that you possibly can by planting the soybeans and getting it ready. We invested two years of our project into this, this field conversion. So let's talk a little bit about the seed itself. Definitely pick a native supplier and the seed that they, they have should be endemic to your region. Uh, we went with the Hamilton Native Seed Company uh, up about an hour south of here. And the mix we chose was a monarch mix, it had plenty of different wildlife, wildfire species, and also some native short, short grasses that uh, work well with the wildflowers. Uh, this is by far going to be your most expensive part of the project. Uh, buying the seed is not cheap, it's anywhere from two to $500 per acre. So when you're working with a, a large scale project like this, it, it's very helpful if you start to make some partnerships such as the Missouri Department of Conservation, the National Wildlife Federation, and the New York Community Trust. And once the seed is purchased, it's time to get it on the ground. And this is done in the winter time. And that's why you see me in, the, in this picture all bundled up. We chose a, a, a nice day in January to see, get the seed on the ground. And you can do it a couple different ways. Uh, for smaller acreages, between one to 10 acres, you can get a bunch of volunteers rounded up and hand out bags of your wildflower seed and line up on the edge of the field, about 20 feet apart and walk across the field, throwing handfuls of seed out. Uh, the seed is very small and sometimes it, it's easy to throw out too much right away. So what we did was mixed uh, some pelleted lime in with the seed. It helps it go a little bit further. Um, also spreads that seed out better. When you start looking at larger tracts of land, 10 acres to 20 acre sections of your field, you're going to use a piece of equipment like this, a tractor or UTV. And what we've attached to the back of it here is a broadcast seeder. And this is a seeder we actually borrowed from a landowner that had similar interest and he's already done his field a couple of years ago, and he said, go ahead, use it. It worked great. Uh, this broadcast seeder, uh, the, we mix in the, the seed and some pelleted lime, and the tail shoot on here shakes back and forth, and it looks a lot like a, a dog wagging its tail, and it shoots the seed about 30 feet on both sides. And I'm going to show a little video of that going, and if that's not the happiest little tractor at Merrimack Spring Park, I don't know what is. So he'll, he'll drive back and forth, spreading the seed on the, the soybean crop residue. And that's how we got it on the ground. Your first summer after seeding, your field's gonna look a little bit like this. You're going to have to do some uh, mowing and use a brush hog, which cuts the grass about uh, 12 inches high. And it's at this stage that uh, you will get a little bit panicked because I don't see any wildflowers in there. But if you look closely, your wildflowers are, are nestled underneath the grass. They're usually less than 12 inches their first year. They're focusing on root development. And these are perennial wildflowers, so they'll get better every single year. The second year, you're really going to start to see some 
some color develop out in your fields. Uh, here at the park, our second year, we saw Mexican hat flower, blazing star, gray-headed coneflower, uh, purple phlox, and some uh, purple coneflower. Here's another shot of the second summer of our field that we Lots of flowers out there, lots of yellows, lots of sunflowers. After your second summer, it is recommended you do some prescribed burning. And if burning is not an option for you, you can also do mowing. Uh, what you're trying to do is reduce the uh, woody stems that will like to creep in your meadow. Uh, basically, you've opened up the land and created this nice, perfect place for seeds to get established. And so lots of trees will try to take over. And that's what the burning helps do. We uh, taught our staff to do it here at the park and the prescribed burn may look uh, a little traumatic and scorched earth, but in a couple months, this is that same field looking very beautiful, vibrant, host to many, many pollinators in this meadow. So some tips and tricks to save you money. Uh, this is gonna be your biggest hurdle on a large scale process, uh, several thousand dollars, and also equipment, it might be a challenge for some people. So uh, I would suggest borrowing any equipment from some of the landowners around and also look at your USDA service centers. They have equipment to rent. Uh, also look for cost share opportunities. There's state, federal, private, organizations that want to do this project also, and they're willing to pay almost uh, all, of, all of the costs, if not half. And don't just look at uh, uh, pollinator uh, organizations, look at quail and pheasants forever, because once you, once you start doing projects like this, uh, you realize it's all, it's all tied together. And if you're helping out the pollinators, eventually it, it helps uh, bring caterpillars out to your to your uh, meadow, that brings the birds. So that brings the quail, pheasants, and turkeys, and deer also. So it's all tied together. As for volunteers, they like to learn. They may be a little nervous about doing this on their own land until they actually see it done somewhere else. And if there's a couple things I would recommend uh, landowners do is invest more time in the seed bed preparation stage. That is something, we didn't do on our first uh, pollinator area. We wanted to get some flowers going as quickly as possible. Um, and so we didn't realize the, the seed bed contains some invasive species that we have to deal with now. So if you have some time, add some more seed, bre seed bed prep time. And also the correct seeding time. You wanna get this seed on the ground early in the winter. So it has at least six to eight weeks of freezing and thawing to help the seed get in the ground, and also what we call cold moist stratification. It's a fancy term that means the seeds that you are planting need to be frozen and thawed several times before they germinate. It's not like planting tomato seeds. So lessons learned here is patience. This is project is going to take a while to get started. Uh, there's a saying we use, it's called uh, the first year it sleeps, the second year it creeps, and the third year it leaps. And if you have to add any uh, seed bed prep time in there, like we did, we put in two years of, of soybean rotation, and now we finally got the seed on the ground, and it'll be about two years before we start seeing some flowers. You'll see some, some flowers your second year, but it really doesn't hit its uh, prime until that third year. Uh, also, signage is important. Uh, when you start changing the landscape, people are going to ask questions. Uh, they're going want to wonder what's going on out there. They're basically the only, the only animal that needs uh, to know what you're doing. The wildlife is going to find you. Um, the humans uh, are basically, we have an uphill battle with uh, our generational tradition of things need to be mowed, they need to be cut short, clean and green. You know, it's definitely a mind shift that we have to work on to learn that a grown up field is actually beauty in the eye of a pollinator. Also new species will pop up every year. If you don't have the money to get a really fancy, uh, very diverse uh, 
wild, wildflower mix, new species will pop up every single year and eventually you'll, st you'll go over the original 20 or 30 species that you, you paid for. And then also keep an eye out for those invasive plants, uh, such as Johnson grass, like you saw in the back of that uh, soybean field, uh, Cerecia lespedesia, crown vetch. Uh, look up in your area, what, what are some uh, invasive species that are, are common to your, to your area and uh, just keep an eye out for them. Because once they start growing in your wildflower garden, it's tough to kill those without killing your wildflowers. And that's Merrimack Springs Park Pollinator Initiative. Thank you guys for joining me and I will give it back to Rebecca. Wes, thank you so much. Now we all know where to go for our glow up in the spring. We'll just head to you. <laughs> um, incredible work that you've been doing there. And you know, I will say I've actually been to the site uh, in St. James and it's pretty astounding to see the amount of life just like billowing out of the meadows that they've planted there. So very exciting and thanks for sharing. Um, but we're not done yet. Up next is Harrison Khan. He's the Vice President of Marketing at Bar Hill Gin, which is, which is a spirit that employs beekeepers, plants native habitat, and does a whole lot more to build a more sustainable business model. He's gonna talk us through multiple ways that businesses and brands can support the, devel the development of pollinator habitat. Take it away, Harry. Thanks so much, Rebecca. And I'd like to you know, start by saying two things. One, it's an absolute, absolute honor to be a part of this panel. I've learned a lot tonight. It's incredible um, from both Jennifer and Wes. And then secondly, I'd like to address the elephant in the room. You're probably all wondering what the heck is a gin distillery doing at this panel? And um, that's gonna be a good segue to our story and how we got into cocktail culture as a business. We came to it by way of agriculture. So Bar Hill Gin, um, was founded by a beekeeper, uh, the gentleman on the left, Todd Hardy. And he partnered with a local fermentation enthusiast who had grown up working in his parents' hardware store, um, who ran a local homebrew store named Ryan Christensen, the fellow on the right. And together, they set out on what has become a life's work to perfect the use of raw honey in a distillery. Now, you may be wondering why raw honey in a gin? Well, gin is all about botanicals. All gins need to have juniper, um, but many gins have many other botanicals. As you all know, honey is all about botanicals as well. So we like to think that this distillery partners with beekeepers as we do around the Northeast and all of their bees to collect wild flavors and bring them back to the hive, where we then work with that raw honey, always keeping it raw, infusing it in our spirits, so it brings that incredible balance and sweetness and floral depth of the raw honey into our spirits. When we host people at our distillery here, they've often never seen honey like this. And it's one of the most rewarding parts of our work is to share what um, is an incredibly special thing that most people don't truly understand because they grew up shopping at grocery stores where the honey that was available was either pasteurized or not 100% um, honey. Um, and we're able to introduce them to what is truly a miracle. This incredible, mysterious, rich um, ingredient that has an amazing floral depth um, that we get to, we're very lucky to be able to work with every day here. Our business started in 2011 in this building down below in Hardwick, Vermont, which is in um, one of the most beautiful and remote agricultural regions in the country. If you've ever been to the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, you know what I'm talking about. Our original original still was up there on the left. Uh, that still is a 15 gallon direct fire copper still. You can see behind me that we've grown over the years, over the last 10 years. Um, but this was our workhorse in the early days. These were our humble origins. And Todd and Ryan knew they were making something special. Their friends and neighbors really liked the gin and our spirits. And they started distributing to some of the top cocktail bars around the country and around the world. They then sent Bar Hill Gin to the New York International Spirits Competition and the Hong Kong International Spirits Competition to see what would happen. And they won the top honor, the absolute best honor among the hundreds of brands that participated in those competitions. And one thing has led to another. You know, needless to say, we've been very busy 
in our distillery. And this is our current home here in Montpelier, Vermont. So we're in central Vermont on the banks of um, the Winooski River. Um, and you can see um, the facility there is where I'm sitting today. Uh, on the top of the building, we have 83 kilowatts of solar that completely offset all of the electricity needed to produce Bar Hill Gin. Um, and we also are very serious about water and heat reclamation. So in the building of our new distillery in 2019, we were able to reduce the amount of water that we use per bottle of gin that we make by 83% by creating a somewhat elaborate closed loop chiller water system inside the facility. Um, so that's a real point of pride for our team. We also reclaim a lot of our heat. So stills put out a fair amount of hot water and we actually channel that hot, hot water to run underneath our outdoor patio, which does double duty for us. One, it cools, back the, it cools the water back down so we can reuse it. And two, it heats the patio. Um, so we um, are able to extend, uh, you know, the, the outdoor dining season um, beyond what is a, a pretty short, you know, summer season here in Vermont. But beyond, um, you know, waste management and renewable energy, most of our fans and our team are truly passionate about pollinators and about bees and honeybees in particular, I will say. And that is because our business simply relies on them. You know, what we all know in this group, I don't need to tell this group this, that one out of every three bites of food relies on the pollinator. And as Rebecca said at the outset of, of this event, um, pollinators are losing their habitat. We believe that because Bar Hill Gin relies so heavily on these incredible creatures and the incredible honey that they, they make, we are in a unique position and have a unique responsibility to champion not just the bees, but all pollinators. So I'm going to introduce you to a program called Bees Knees Week, which is an initiative we started in 2017 and has continued to grow in momentum over the last six years and maybe how many of you actually know about Bar Hill Gin. So without further ado, I'm going to roll the tape. We're on a quest to make flawless landcrafted spirits. Inspired by the land and true to its essence, Bar Hill Gin is our ode to the hardworking bees that make our spirits possible. This is our livelihood. Each year, you help us honor the land with a week-long celebration we call Bees Knees Week, when we mix, share, and protect the bees. Bees are responsible for one in every three bites of food that we eat, and yet a third of the bees die each year. We can help by replenishing their habitat so that they can thrive. This Bees Knees Week, share your Bees Knees cocktail on social media. Use the hashtag Bees Knees Week and we will plant 10 square feet of pollinator habitat for every post. Join us for Bees Knees Week. Drink the best and save the bees. And when we started in 2017, we had no idea that Bees Knees Week was going to become the largest sustainability event in the spirits industry. We knew that bartenders and our fans held us to a very high standard. And we knew that we needed to do something meaningful to protect pollinators. And I love what Wes said about, you know, first year it sleeps, second year it creeps, third year it leaps. It's taken us about seven years to leap, um, but I think we're finally getting there. Bees Knees Week wrapped up last Sunday on the 22nd, and we recruited enough social media posts using the hashtag Bees Knees Week that we've committed to plant 250,000 square feet of pollinator habitat. Um, so, you know, just 5.7 acres, which is nothing compared to what Wes's organization has done so far, but it adds up with each year. So we're over 10, 10 acres now over the last two years. Um, and we engage more than 2,400 bars and restaurants around the country in this program. So the way a lot of people discover Bees Knees Week, and we hope learn about the importance of protecting and planting pollinator habitat is actually when they're out with their friends and they'll see on the menu at a cocktail bar or they'll hear from their bartender or their waiter or server that they should drink a Bees Knees cocktail, which is a prohibition era cocktail and share a photo on social media. And for every post that gets shared, Bar Hill Gin plants 10 square feet of pollinator habitat. So square foot by square foot, it adds up. And that's how this program works. We are not experts in planting pollinator habitat ourselves. Um, we focus on what we know best. Uh, but we partner with nonprofits. So with each post that comes through, we make a donation to a, a nonprofit that specializes in planting pollinator habitat. You know, when I think about what makes a good 
sustainability initiative. Bees Knees Week is obviously one of my favorite examples, but I think it fits the bill in three key ways. Number one, it fits our mission. So I would ask yourself if you represent a brand or a business or an organization, and, and you're thinking about taking on a sustainability initiative, first ask yourself, you know, does this initiative fit our organization's mission at the highest level? Will it make sense with our mission if we invest a lot of our time and resources in this initiative? So Bees Knees Week is an example of a program that fits Bar Hill's mission, which is to reconnect cocktail culture to agriculture. Secondly, is it relevant to your stakeholders? So will your customers, will your partners, other people who you rely on to do your core work, will they want to join you in this initiative? So Bees Knees Week is a good example of this because we work a lot with bartenders and with chefs. And if anyone knows the importance of a healthy pollinator pop population, it's bartenders and chefs because they're working with ingredients that many of which rely on um, a honeybee or another pollinator to exist. And then lastly, is there an element of shared value? So will the initiative meet its goals while also simultaneously making your organization stronger? So I mentioned up front that we rely on the honeybee and on beekeepers to source um, our incredible you know, raw honey, the, this, this amazing ingredient that we work with every day. So without pollinators, we can't do that. Secondly, with every post that comes through, we're happy, we hope that there are as many posts as possible, right? We would love to double it, every, double the program every year because with each one that comes through, although we have to make a donation to one of our nonprofit partners, we are happy to make it and wanna keep on making more and more and more because it's one of the most efficient ways that we're able to communicate our mission and products. So fans of ours are all of a sudden during Bees Knees Week sharing Bar Hill Gin and the importance of pollinator, pollinator habitat with their personal networks. So we're, we like to think that we're trying to create, help create a movement around planting pollinator habitat and making it really easy for a lot of people who might not otherwise have the skills and the knowledge to do it themselves, or may just not be in a place where they have land or can pick up a shovel. All they need to do is post a photo on social media and we take care of the rest. So that is a little bit about Bees Knees Week. Um, and you know, again, thank you so much for the time to introduce myself and our organization here at Bar Hill. I'll pass it over to Rebecca now. Thanks, Harry. And thank you everybody for sharing your expertise and your experiences today. Um, FYI, for those of you who've been watching all the excitement happening in the Q&A, we do have a secret panelist today uh, who is our very own founder and chief uh, melatologist, Guillermo Fernandez. And so he's been getting some of the conversations started on the really exciting questions that have come up. Um, but now, and Wes, we'd love to see your face again. Come back, come back to the screen. Um, the group of us is going to start tackling some of the things that have come up in chat. Um, so early on, someone had asked, and Guillermo began to answer this question uh, toward Jenny, actually, about sourcing uh, some of these plants. Um, such as sedges, et cetera, that help do some ground prepper. And I'm wondering like, you know, to expand on the question that came up, do you have any tips on how people can even find the right types of places that they can go for these plants? Like, is this the Home Depot thing? Is it like Walmart? Okay, what's the scoop? How can people find these plants near them? Yeah, so that's a great question. And so one thing I do is when I'm in a new area, um, I'll Google, uh, native plant growers or nurseries. And then if I can't find them, then I will just go to my local nursery and you, not, I'll find a small nursery, not like a big box place. And I'll ask them if they have any native plants to get kind of gauge what their um, knowledge is. And then um, if they don't have any native plants, then I'll, um, you know, just asking the more people that ask at garden centers for native plants, the more chance they'll get because they want to have customers, right? So, um, and then another great thing you can do is, um, I was just taking notes about it. Um, then also the Xerces Society, that's X-E-R-C-E-S for anyone who doesn't know. Um, they have great lists for different um, native pollinator plants in each region in the US or almost every region in the US. And then also here locally in New York City, um, we have the Long Island Native Plant Initiative and they have some great local plants here. So you can also um, contact your master gardeners. They might have some great resources. Um, 
and that's a, that's the place to start, I think. Awesome, thanks so much. And you know, there's a question in the chat that, uh, or in the Q and A, that I think probably uh, Jenny and Wes may have some thoughts on, which is this question of the bare soil, right? Like we say, let's leave the soil bare so that those ground bees can get in there. And Jenny, you were just talking about some, you know, complementary strategies to that, such as doing ground cover so that it is bare, not bare. But how? What are your weed strategies? You know what? How can people um, have a low impact relationship to their garden? Meaning, you know, not a ton of work on it, not disturbing ground bees, um, but still keep some of those pesky weeds away. Was that for me? For either of you, I, I know that you both dealt with them in your own capacity, so I figure there's some juicy secrets that you can share with us. Well, on a small scale that I've dealt with, just weeding often and early and pulling them out by the root is the best um, way to keep them from getting out of hand because things like mugwort can just really take over quickly. So um, early, often, and by the root. I usually try to fill in some of the, the holes in the garden where you don't have plants with uh, a ground cover like mulch or something like that. So it's interesting that you should mention mulch west because there's a different um, philosophy that we think a lot about um, at the Bee Conservancy um, because mulch is sort of like that, like a blanket that you could possibly pull over uh, ground nesting sites. So I wonder, you know, and there's this conversation that we're having together about, you know, possibly like leaving leaf litter or other like lighter versions of that cover, right? Because when you think of mulch again, like I start thinking about that bright red stuff that you could get like in a big oh. heavy bag or like, yeah, so can maybe we even talk about like the concept of mulch and like, you know, what we can do either as alternatives or perhaps more pollinator friendly versions of it in our spaces. So I, um, yeah, so leaf litter is great because it's free, it's there every year and it, the, the bees have naturally evolved with it to just kind of tunnel in a little bit to make their nest. And, um, you know, sometimes people use mulch for weed suppression and water retention, which is fine if, well, I shouldn't say it's fine, but it's, it's not a great practice on a large scale and if you, pack a lot of times mulch is packed really high so the bees can't get in to make nests but um you know if you scatter loose twigs and just like garden debris from your garden in the area that should be okay um but the thick mulch is hard for them to penetrate always learning <laughs> i usually try to use like a it's nothing I would get from the store, like the box store, but it's like a, a composted material just for small gardens and stuff. Well, Wes, there are some more questions about how you did what you did, and specifically in the Q&A, um, there are two where Carmen asks, how did they get rid of that grass? And Shirley would love to know what was done with that Johnson weed, like how did you get rid of it? Uh, when you, you, we contracted with the farmer to remove the grass, he used a combination of different herbicides to initially spray and kill the, the grass. And, and unfortunately that's just part of what you'll have to do or on a large landscape like that, or it's most cost effective to do it like that. Gardens, you could use a, like a, a dark tarp or something or plastic to kind of shade out the grass and then you'll kill it that way. But on a large scale like that, that's what the farmer's gonna use. We also used a no-till drill. So once the grass is, is killed out, uh, a no-till no drill sounds, it's more like a knife that's cutting through the ground. It drops the soybean in it and then covers it back up. And so you're not disturbing or turning over the soil. You don't have a lot of soil erosion that way. You can keep the the, the Oh, I think we might have gotten Wes frozen. So maybe while, oh, Wes, we just lost the tail end of what you said because you froze. Could you repeat it for us, please? Sorry, uh, the, the, the roots of the, of the grass actually hold the ground um, in place. So you don't have a lot of uh, erosion. Also, 
uh, you don't bring up a lot of new weed seeds when you, you don't, we're not tilling up the soil. Um, Great. Well, the second part of your question, uh, we, so we've removed the, oh. Was the Johnson the, weed in the grass? Yeah. Right, uh, there's very, there's some very specific uh, herbicides you can use that will tackle Johnson grass and it's an uh, ongoing process that you'll have to keep after. Uh, it's a very persistent weed once it gets started. Uh, we used yeah. a herbicide called Panoramic. I mean, I do think, right, that the work is ongoing because it, it becomes a human versus wild um, scenario all the time. Um, I did see, Harry, there was a question for you that you wanted to answer live about vodka. I'm um, just learning to, to work the chat here. I actually just answered that question to Pete over the, the written Q&A, but I'll, I'll share if um, Pete asked, Pete Costello asked if Barhel Vodka, which is another spirit that we make, relies on honey, just like the gin does. And the answer is that it, it, it does. Barhel Vodka is, um, some of you may think about potatoes or corn or wheat when you think about vodka as the sugar source for that spirit. Um, Barhel Vodka is actually distilled 100% from raw honeys, um, wildflower honeys, um, sourced from um, apiaries around 250 mile radius around the distillery. Um, and um, that's it. So there's no other sugar source. Thanks for that. Now there's a question um, from Texas and they are wondering, um, since we can't use weed killers for weed control, it becomes a big chore to keep the weeds and grass under control. Um, what type of ground cover plants would you recommend for this application? And um, someone may have a direct answer to that, uh, but since of course there are people from all across the country on this call as well, if you have tips in general, um, you know, for weeds and grass, that would be great. But does anyone have an answer for Texas specifically? Or how to find out in Texas? Okay, well then I would just circle back to the advice that Jenny had um, offered earlier at the beginning, which is to call the native uh, plant sources and look up, you know, Google is your friend, uh, resources like the Xerces Society has a ton of great expertise on local ground cover crops that help suppress weeds. And some of them are like quite ornamental and pretty, you know, they'll have like in, in some areas where people plant a lot of clover, um, those plants which are very prolific um, and also provide a ton of food source. Um, do a great job like low flower cover uh, as well. Okay, so I think we have time for one more question. I'm going to kind of deviate a little from the Q&A and ask everybody, you know, on the panel, what easy piece of advice do you have to get people doing something in the habitat? And like, what I mean by that is I think as individuals, we kind of feel, or we can feel a little powerless, right? To make big change. Um, but maybe uh, there's a universe in which a lot of little change can have a big impact. And so I guess I push it to my panelists and even Guillermo who is uh, behind his icon right now. But what is one tip or piece of advice that you'd like to get, have folks leave tonight's session with? That they can just kind of go out and, and bring into the world in the coming days and weeks. I would say um, that it would be great um, to use iNaturalist to identify some of the plants that you find, just the closest plants you find around you, whether it's the street tree outside, the weeds in the sidewalk cracks, because I'm talking from an urban point of view, um, plants in your neighbor's yard. When I say yard, I mean those little front areas in, in front of the stoop. And um, just start to get to know your local plants and what's actually there and find out if it's native or not native and that'll just snowball from there. And for those of you who are not familiar with iNaturalist, it is an amazing app that um, connects your photos. So like, if you like taking selfies, if you're one of those constant like, you know, photo bugs, um, you can take photos of anything natural around you and it gets uploaded to a database that is then tapped into by over a million researchers um, and scientists and naturalists around the world. And then the species get identified that way. So very cool project. Thanks for that, Jenny. Uh, how about you, Wes? 
Uh, I would say when you, you're out there looking at your yard or driving through an area, like if you manage any kind of municipal or, or city area, like ask yourself, do I really need to mow that? Or, you know, just let it go or try to convert it into a native native grass or plant some wildflowers. It's amazing how much time we invest in keeping the grass cut. So if there's areas out there that can be let go, let them, you know, plant something different. Love that. Harry? The advice is to get to know your local beekeeper. Um, support your local beekeeper, buy their honey. They are often wealth of knowledge about this topic and incredibly generous with their time. They're also the first to tell you that there are a lot of pollinators that are, that are important beyond the honeybee, and they're an inspiration, um, you know, for um, for investing in our communities and their environment. Love that. And actually, just to shout out a couple of great um, details that are coming out of the chat. Um, there's advocacy for compost. Yes, it's an it's personally a passion of mine, but great for the soil, great for the earth. Uh, yes, turn to schools and senior centers and local community members that either might engage in the world outside or find opportunities to grow and flourish because they're exploring the outside. Um, we could go on forever. This is a great topic and we're so excited to see all this participation in the Q&A and chat, but we are at time this evening. So I would like to extend an incredible thank you, first of all, to our panelists for their time, their beautiful slides, their thoughtful presentations. Of course, everybody here who's joined us tonight for this amazing conversation in the chat and the Q&A. Um, we will have a recording uh, being emailed out to all attendees uh, in the coming days. So stay tuned for that. And otherwise, um, we'll keep the chat open for a little longer so we can get our last thoughts in. If you'd like to join the Bee Conservancy's Community Science Project on iNaturalist, um, please feel free to click this QR code on the left. Um, of course, we are a nonprofit based in uh, New York, but we do work nationally and into Canada. And if you'd like to make a donation, we can um, continue to keep programming like this going. And otherwise, thank you, thank you, thank you. Get out there and hug a tree, plant a flower, dance like a bee, um, and be inspired by all the amazing things that nature gives us. Take care, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>